Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jean-Louis Vigneault and Mainframe as a Service. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about Mainframe as a Service. So what is Mainframe Service? It's not a product. It's more about a platform, a vision statement. It gives you an indication of where we want to go uh, with CA and how we want to position, provide our products and services moving forward. And what has been driving this vision is the fact that we want to keep mainframe relevant moving forward. You know, we are in a world of digital transformation and mainframe is often perceived as a huge cost by CIOs, CEOs, a big line of cost. And it's also perceived as hindering the ability to transform quickly and rapidly. And uh, so, so we have been thinking about what can we do to change the game? And that's really what has been behind you know, our thinking here. And the way we, we addressed it, or the vision we had was to say, well, would it be great if we could consume mainframe services or build mainframe application like we are doing with, in cloud? You know, think about AWS, you know, how I can easily provision a service, I can easily uh, develop an application leveraging those services and publishing this application in the cloud. So we have been thinking, so this is what I'm going to talk about today. So some of it is really about vision. You know, we have no real uh, deliveries behind that yet. And some of it you can see being demonstrated in the show floor. So there is a mix of vision and stuff we are really ready to share with you and start validation program with you on that topic. So having said that, Well, it's really about information in that case. Uh, the first things I've been saying is, well, you know, we need to keep mainframe relevant. And the question is why, you know, why should we keep mainframe relevant? But the point is, you know, if when we interview our customers, we found out that 78% of our customers are looking to increase their usage of mainframe over time. So, and what we know is that, you know, we have about, it's, it's a huge impact on the business. One to three million CICS transactions per second is run on mainframe. We have about you know, 2 220 billion line of code of COBOL code running on mainframe. Uh, we have you know, 23 of the 25 top airlines running on mainframe. We have uh, more than 90 banks on 100 running on mainframe. So the entire world economy is based on mainframe. And that's what, you know, makes it necessary to keep the mainframe relevant uh, in this world. And what we found as we were interviewing our customers is that, you know, 49% you know, were not doing agile development, 66% were not really having DevOps practices fully integrated, and we know that it's a mandatory step to, to get to enable, support the digital transformation. So, so that's one of the key elements. We will have to address here what can we do to make it easier. So, you know, and I'm going to be talking about, you know, so what is it we are looking to achieve with Medframe as a service? So, so first, let's start with the economics, you know. It's all about how do I align uh, the cost to the value? And it's really in a cloud buying experience is I should be paying based on the value I receive, not in based on the number of MIPS I, I have a total for my, for my mainframe. From a development perspective, you know, the question is how do I architect a DevOps tool chain? You know, my developers are my developers and they are in line of business. They have to update uh, you know, application the mainframe. They use their own tool. They don't want to work on green screen. They don't want to be forced to change tools. So what can we do to go where the developers are instead of asking them to change. So that's another type of question we had to address. You know, what can we do? How can we automate? Uh, what, how can you do to facilitate the automation of the processes? On the inside, we have a set of questions like, you know, how can we address the short of skills in both developments and operation? So, so another set of questions here. And, and from a security perspective, what we found out is that you know, uh, onboarding new users, onboarding a developers could be perceived as something very, very long process. You know, in some of the, our customers were saying, you know, 
I'm fine, you know, but each time I have a new developer, it takes me six weeks to get him on board it from a security perspective on the mainframe. And that's where we cannot continue in this changing world. So, so that's the type of issues we want to address as, as we move forward. So, you know, talking about, you know, what, you know, a CEO, what kind of issues a CEO is seeing with mainframe? Well, certainly the cost to operate is one of them. Uh, the lack of specialized skills is another issue he needs to deal with. And the speed, meeting service level agreements, another kind of issue he's looking for. The quality of services, the vendor, the passive vendor lock-in. And you know, if you have seen with Ashok this morning, uh, yesterday morning during the keynote, and he was referring that it's not only mainframe that give you this feeling now, because you know, if you go to AWS, you have the same kind of vendor lock-in. So what can we do to avoid that? Uh, data privacy and security is another concern they have. So what would change a game for them? Well, certainly, you know, if we were able to deliver you know, zero downtime, like mainframe is able to, to deliver, if we were able to protect and ensure zero breaches, and if we were able to, to deliver such a service that the line of business would be praising you know, IT organization about you know, how successful they are with a mainframe, then that would change the game and that would change the views of the CEO on mainframe. So it's all really about enabling mainframe to become uh, an enabler of success. So that's what we have in mind. So, and I'll start you know, with you know, the first here, the first point which is related to the economics of mainframe. And, and the idea here was, well, wouldn't it be great if you could provision services on mainframe so you could easily provision, install, configure a services if the services would be available through a set of APIs so you can easily consume your service. And, and that's you know, like, you know, really like if you were in AWS. So that's what the thinking is behind here. So providing this cloud buying experience, enabling people to uh, select a service, try about it, find a, you know, if it's useful or not. If it's not useful, forget about it. If it's useful, start to deploy it more extensively and consume more and more of it. So that's you know, what we have been thinking about here, self-service provisioning, availability of services, in, uh, in API, an API catalog. So, you know, our products over time become available as services, provide APIs. So a mock-up of, uh, of what could be uh, an API portal where you could, you know, see the various services, uh, set of APIs uh, that would be available for you. You could decide to provision them and start running them, you know, and using them. So that's one of the first objective we have here, enabling this type of consumption. The next objective we have here is to provide developers with the ability to use and work on the mainframe using the standard tools they are using today. They are using Sublime to edit code, they are using Visual Studio Code, they are using whatever tool, they are using Jenkins, they are using a bunch of tools there, and they want to keep using their tools regardless of the platform. So what can we do to enable that? Uh, from a DevOps architect perspective, you know, we have the same question is, I'm using Jenkins, I'm using my set of continuous integration, continuous deployment tools. You know, what can I do to just make mainframe like any other deployment platform so I can have that being part of my continuous integration process and being used from the tools I'm already using. So, so that's you know, what we have been thinking. And, I'm, you know, and that's something we demo on the show floor. It's called Project Brightside. So I'm going to talk a bit more about it. And if you want to see later on in, in action, you, know, you can really find out Sajay uh, on the floor and he will show you uh, what, uh, what we can do. So let's start with a, a use case here. And, and the persona we have been looking into was a developer, potentially in a line of business, a potentially very young, millennial developers, very young, uh, not much experience, but used to be working 
with a set of tools, open source tools, could we be working with Git, could be working with whatever ID they want. And, and this developer has to perform a change, and the change can you know, cross multiple platforms from mobile to mainframe. And so part of the change the developer will have to do is on mainframe. But one thing you shouldn't expect is that the developer should not have to learn mainframe. He's not willing to learn mainframe, specificities of mainframe. You know, he can do COBOL if needed, but understanding in depth mainframe, that's not really what he wants on, uh, on his uh, resume. So in our scenario, you know, Michelle, uh, our developer, you know, she wants to be able to code like for the platform, like if she was coding for any other platform. So she wants to be using a favorite code editor, Visual Studio.code, Sublime, IntelliJ, whatever. Uh, we should be open. And she's going to use Brightside, which is, a, in our case, Brightside's command line interface. The great thing about command line interface is that it's a human interface, so you can interact with, and as a human, use command line. But as well, it's an API because now you can script the CLI and you know automate a set of things, and, and that it you know looks like in, we are back in the 80s. But the thing is that when a developer work on uh, AWS, most often he's using CLI and API. He's not using you know big a, a UI and so on. The user experience is using leveraging the power of a CLI or an API. And, and that you know, provides a lot of value. And because of the CLI, you can easily integrate with Visual Studio.code, you can visually, easily integrate with IntelliJ, IntelliJ. So having a CLI that enables you to interact with mainframe uh, from your user desktop has a great potential uh, as it enables you to keep using the tools uh, you are used to do today. So she may be using Git, you know, has a source control system because she's used to at school. Uh, she has been learning Git, she knows Git. It's a great tool for team collaboration. So we have several people working together and we do some parallel development, we want to merge and we want to track our changes. Git is great. I don't need to learn anything else. I don't want to learn anything else. The background may be Endeavor running the back, you know, behind the scene. What the developers see is Git. What's running behind the scene is Endeavor, you know, on the mainframe, as you have probably, you know, your COBOL code and your continuous integration uh, on the mainframe being based on an SCM like Endeavor. So what we have been working here is to provide a Git front end to Endeavor. So the user experience is Git. What's behind the scene is Endeavor. So when I push my changes to Git, they are pushed to Endeavor, and the, the continuous integration process is kicked. So that's what Michelle is going to do. She's going to be, you know, uh, editing a code in bright, uh, using a favorite ID. She's going to leverage Brightside to integrate the ID with the mainframe so she can get the source code. She can update the source code. She can save the source code. And she is going to use uh, build tools such as Gulp to, uh, to do the build, like if it was Java code or anything else. It's COBOL, so what? Same process, same tools. And, and because we are leveraging command line, you know, we can talk to the mainframe, and that's what's going to happen here. She can debug, she can rebuild, you know, as she progress, and at some point of time, you know, she will commit a changes into Git, and that will kick uh, the continuous integration pipeline. So that's the user experience. What we are doing here is we are enabling a developer to work the same way with COBOL on mainframe than they are used to do Java on the, on the distributed or JavaScript on the distributed side of the house. Same user experience. So that's the powerful aspect of, uh, of the change here. If I think now as a DevOps architect, the challenge is the same, is as DevOps architect, I'm building my continuous integration, my continuous delivery pipeline, and, you know, and I want it to be the same, we're using the same tools regardless of what I'm building, deploying. You know, some part may be on the mainframe, some part may be on, uh, on the distributed side of the platform. So, it's going to use, you know, 
a JAL process is going to use, uh, you know, tools such as uh, Gradle to, uh, to do the build, and it's going to leverage, again, a bright side, the command line interface, into the continuous integration scripts, continuous delivery scripts, so, uh, you know, the code can be deployed and built automatically on, uh, on the mainframe platform using the same tools he's using today. You know, he can have, you know, a trigger when they push into Git, this is triggered, the delivery pipeline is started, the test can be automatically executed. And again, for the testing, you could be using a testing framework on the, on the desktop or the, on the distributed sites, such as Mocha.js or any other test framework to drive the testing even on the mainframe. So I'm using the same tools for continuous testing, you know, as for the rest of the, my application. And I can, you know, drive my delivery pipeline using tools I'm used to, Jenkins and so on. So that's, again, the user experience we intend to deliver. And that user experience is delivered with what we call Project Brightside, you know, and that's something we demo today. And we are, you know, ready to engage with customers on the validation program. So should you be interested, should you have development team that are willing to, uh, to investigate uh, this uh, kind of approach. So to summarize what I just said here, you know, usually what you have is what we provide or what, you know, main, mainframe tool providers do, they provide tools that are specific to the mainframe. So if you want to be able to, uh, to uh, develop on mainframe, you are going to have an IDE on the desktop side, which is often based on Eclipse. You know, it can be CADZ, it could be an IBM product, could be a computer product. It's all the same technology. It's an advanced ID built on Eclipse. So in that case, developer has to change and learn using this ID. With Brightside, we change the game because now what we say is with the help of Brightside, you can be using whatever ID you want. We don't force you to switch to a off ID. For the build, the build is often run, you know, through your SCM system, in the case SCM Endeavor, but you could be driving it from the desktop perspective, uh, leveraging Gulp, Gradle, Maven, because that's a tool the developers are using. So that's, you know, a change of the user experience. Technology behind the scene may be still Endeavor, but the user experience is I'm building from starting my, my Gradle script, for instance. Uh, we talked about code testing and debugging. You know, we can use, again, advanced tools inside the, the advanced IDs to do the unit testing, but nothing prevents you now with Brightside to be leveraging an existing uh, testing framework. So you can test on mainframe the same way you test the rest of your application, and so on. Uh, we can provide, you know, easy access to uh, any kind of code quality tools, SonarCube, and so on. Uh, we can provide through continuous integration the ability to use any kind of scripting language because now through CLI it's easy to integrate with mainframe. We can use Jenkins, Travis CI, Circle CI, all these you know, continuous integration tools that are available on the market. Again, it's possible. And for continuous delivery, you know, yes, you can use Atomic and so on, but if, you, you know, if your delivery is not so complex, you may sometimes live with a, a Jenkins to, to deploy a, a subset of your application. So that's what the power of Brightside. Brightside you enable you to open and have an open architecture. Uh, and so if you want to see Project Brightside on the show floor, you know, we, have a, we have a very nice demo uh, highlighting what I'm talking about here. Another aspect when we discuss with customers, it's often related to the dependency the development teams have on IT operation. You know, if I need a test environment, a development environment, test environment, I have to submit a request, go through a process, and maybe a few weeks later, I'm getting my test environment. That's not the way it works on the distributed side. On the distributed side, I need a test environment, I can provision it, and right away start working on it. So 
again, that's what we have been working on. Ability to self-service provision a dev test environment with a Kix region, with DB2 installed, with uh, WAS installed, anything you need for you to be able to run uh, your dev test uh, scripts and to test your application. So that's something we have been working on. Uh, obviously, it may have cost implications. So when we discuss usually with IT ops, no, I don't want my developers to create test environment because this effort, let them do that. You know, they are going to increase the MIPS consumption and it's going to increase my MLC. So, so there is a trade-off here. And IBM, as you may know, is also making some improvement, you know, enabling to, uh, with the new container pricing they are providing, you know, reducing the pressure uh, that dev test is putting on the monthly license charging. So, so that's something that you know, we are building on, uh, enabling developers to more quickly provision and deprovision uh, dev test environment. And, and the scenario here is very similar to the, the one I showed with Michelle. You know, at some point in the process, Michelle will want to test application. We want to try out, build, test application, verify the change he's making is available. And what she will be able is to, from bright side, to you know, request through CLI the provisioning of a dev test environment. And that's something going to be fairly quick. So instead of waiting days, weeks, you know, it may be something process that you know, is executed in a matter of minutes. So I'm provisioning my dev test environment, I'm building on it, I'm testing, I'm fine with the change, I'm deprovisioning the test environment, I commit my change. So that's something that no, we can do. And again, that's something you can, uh, you can see on the show floor. And uh, we also have been making uh, uh, some, uh, some good demonstration of that. So that's for development. You know, now if we think in terms of uh, IT operation, you know, how can we deal with a shortage of skills in IT operation? And that's so I'm going to refer to a product you may have seen presentation here, which is mainframe operational intelligence, which is how we can leverage machine learning and, uh, and plug it into uh, the operation tools to uh, help improve you know, our ability to, uh, to support and improve the processes as it relates to uh, managing the operation. And one of the goals of, uh, of MOI, so mainframe operational intelligence, is to enable moving from you know, dealing with expert and requesting expert all the time, each time you have an issue or maybe something that could be an issue, you request an expert to, to dive into it, is to find out ways to you know, enable less specialized uh, experts uh, and to at some level, at some point, automate uh, resolution of issues that, uh, that you find and you know how to, to resolve. So MY provides mechanisms to modernize the user experience, to detect anomaly, detect patterns of anomaly. So, and, and Jeff was earlier on, on stage and Vikas also have been talking about it earlier on stage on how MOI can help identify those issues. And for some of those, you know, we can go on, automate the resolution. And by doing so, we free time. We free time of the experts. We enable people that are younger, uh, less skills, to be able to deal with you know, the day-to-day -day, uh, operation and have less impact on, on the experts. So that's what MOI is about here. And the last objective we have you know, with mainframe as service in our vision is coming back to uh, the security aspect. And one of the concerns here uh, we are dealing, you know, when we are talking with customers, is how I do provision a developer on, uh, on my mainframe? How do I get you know, quickly onboard my developers? And one of our customers saying, it takes me six weeks, six weeks to provision a developer, to have him all the security clearance and so on. So again, that's part of the vision, we are not yet there, but our goal would be to enable, you know, as part of provisioning of a user, to you know, automatically 
have you know, the security clearance for that user so he can start working you know, almost immediately. So that's what we're working on. So that concludes the presentation you know, on mainframe service. That's our vision. So to summarize, addressing mainframe economics with a cloud buying experience, enabling developers to work like they are used to and see mainframe like any other deployment platform, also leveraging their tools. It's about reducing the dependency of the development teams with the IT operation, enabling them to self-service provision their dev test environment. It's about addressing the shortage of skills in IT operations through machine learning and operational intelligence. And it's about automating security, so facilitating onboarding of new users. So that's what's driving the vision uh, we have for the future of, uh, of our offerings moving forward on mainframe. So at this point, you know, if you have any question, you know, you're welcome to.